Hello and good afternoon. I'm Alva Adams Mason, Executive Group Manager, Multicultural Business Alliance Strategy and Dealer Relations for Toyota Motor North America. It's an honor to join everyone again and to continue our support for the Congressional Black Caucus Annual Legislative Conference and this brain trust with Chairwoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. Education is a defining issue. We strongly believe that all children should have equal access to opportunities and a pathway to high growth careers, no matter their background or where they live. Today, there are millions of great positions that require science, technology, engineering, and math skills that go unfilled, and millions more that will be created as our industry evolves and Toyota becomes a mobility company. These jobs are launching paths for fulfilling and rewarding careers, and we need to do everything to help prepare, motivate, and inspire our youth to embrace these opportunities. We can't wait as technology demands ever higher levels of skills. Developing autonomous vehicles, connected technologies, and new ways of moving and living all require highly specialized and valued professionals. Each of us hope our youth me now with my grandchildren can get a great job, a fulfilling career that they are happy and healthy. These are basics that are vital for their future and the future of our country. I think the chairwoman put it right when she said upon introducing the STEM Opportunities Act, quote, our economic future relies on what we do now to nurture the STEM talent that would be necessary to meet the demands of an increasingly technological and knowledge-based economy. Today, Toyota is actively engaged across the education continuum, working with academia, local and national nonprofits, government, and the community to prepare and motivate students. One example is our holistic engagement in West Dallas, where together with Southern Methodist University, Dallas Independent School District, and the West Dallas community, we are creating a pre-K through eighth grade STEM focused school with industry informed curriculum. Beyond that, we are bringing together our nonprofit partners, team members, as well as Toyota's know-how to address both in school and out of school issues that impact and derail learning. This is an approach we aim to replicate across our operational footprint, and we believe it will expand jobs in our sector uplift the community and create access to opportunity while also strengthening our company and society. As we roll this out across the United States, we look forward to collaborating with all of you on our mission to create limitless possibilities for all. Thank you again, Chairwoman Johnson, for your leadership in our journey towards a more prosperous future. Hello and welcome to the 2021st Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Science and Technology Brain Trust. I'd like to thank all of our distinguished panel, whom I'm very proud of, for being with us today, as well as thanking our sponsors, Toyota, Amgen, Genetech, and Bayer for making this event possible. Most importantly, I want to thank everyone watching today for joining this important discussion. When creating this brain trust 29 years ago, I envisioned a program that would support and inspire young black students across the country to pursue careers in STEM. I saw the brain trust as an opportunity to connect these students with prominent leaders and professionals who by, by example could help students realize that they too can excel in STEM fields. Over the years, we have welcomed panelists from all sectors of the workforce to offer their insights, 
advice, solutions to increase diversity in our nation's science and technology fields. And I look forward to continuing this tradition today. This year's theme, Yes We Can, recognizing and empowering women in STEM will further strengthen and diversify the STEM education to workforce pipeline, especially for black women and girls. Our panel will feature professionals from major companies and government entities discussing the challenges and solutions to increasing diversity and what each of them is doing to address these issues. They will also discuss why it's so essential that we have diversity in STEM and what society misses out on when the minority population is not well represented in STEM fields. These are all issues I have worked on throughout my career in Congress, especially as chairwoman of the House Committee on Science, Space and Technology. I've also served as the founder and co-chair of Diversity and Innovation Caucus and the House Historically Black Colleges and University Caucus, which I started when I was chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, and also co-chair of the Technology Infrastructure Development and Task Force of the Congressional Black Caucus. So through all of these positions, I have and will continue to emphasize the need for investments in STEM education to encourage young people to pursue STEM careers and to work on cultivating more diversity in STEM related fields. Although there's much work that remains to be done to ensure that we have a diverse representation of talent acquisition in STEM, I also recognize the progress we have made when I first started the Brain Trust until today. Most of the students tuning in today know that STEM is, know what it is, why it's important, and there are several opportunities for them to take advantage of. There's massive change from 20 years ago, but who knows we, where we'll be 20 years from now. It could be one of you watching today who will lead our efforts to go to Mars, or who will cure cancer, or who will develop technology to address climate change. So I look forward to having a productive discussion today. At this time, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists. We're joined today by a group of dynamic, highly qualified Black women who have made great strides in different STEM fields. Up first, we'll have Ms. Vanessa Weich, the director of the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Next, we will have Dr. Vivian Johnson, Senior Vice President of Clinical Services in Parkland Hospital uh, Health and Hospital System in my home district of Dallas. Then next, we'll have Ms. Tracy Hamilton, Director of Program and Product Management for Texas Instruments Education Technology. We're also joined by our first officer, Charlene Short, a pilot with American Airlines. Next is Ms. Sean Purvis, the Corporate Vice President and President of Enterprise Services at Northrop Gorman. And finally, we'll have Ms. Erica Mollett, the CEO of Conduct Day of Con Decay Technology. Each of our panelists will have five minutes to share their perspectives and exercise experiences as Black women in STEM. And what inspired them to choose this career? Following, if we have time, we'll entertain some of your questions that you'll call in. Ms. Watch, you now can begin. Thank you so very much for asking me to be a part of the panel today. Um, I'll share a little bit about my background. Um, so I'm Vanessa Weich. I'm a proud South Carolinian and a Clemson University alum. And as director of NASA's Johnson Space Center here in Houston, I lead an organization of engineers, scientists, and many other STEM professionals and business professionals to lead human exploration for the United States. NASA is called to land American astronauts 
including the first woman and the next man and the first person of color on the moon. And we'll do that through the Artemis program. And we'll go to the moon like we've never done before with innovative partnerships, technologies, and systems to study and explore. And then we will take the next giant leap and go to Mars. So as a young child, um, I was always interested in how things worked. I asked a lot of questions and literally took things apart. My father and mother were both educators and they just encouraged me to be curious. And um, they also, of course, encouraged me to excel as a student. And I really loved math and science. And so with their encouragement, um, I took all of the uh, opportunities that I had in front of me. You know, however, when I was in school at that time and we did not have uh, technology classes or engineering classes, at the high school level. Um, so what really got me interested in science was one uh, Christmas, my brother got a chemistry set for Christmas and we did experiments in the backyard. And that really just got me hooked. And so with that, when I went off to college, um, I will tell you that my 10th grade biology teacher, her name was Mrs. Lane. Uh, she said, you know, hey, Vanessa, I think you're really good at this and maybe you can do it as a career. And so when I, I went off to college, I started out as a biochemistry major. Uh, I will tell you, I found out pretty quickly that I wasn't fond of microscopes. And so with that, I started asking around about different career fields. I didn't even know what an engineer was when I went to college. But with talking with my professors and my brother, who was actually studying chemical engineer at the time, uh, they said to me, hey, you like to analyze things. Maybe you should try engineering. And I did, and I was hooked. I found my love, and I've, I've never looked back. Uh, fortunate for me, I was able to go on and get a master's in bioengineering. And uh, from there, I went to the Food and Drug Administration, uh, was hired to do um, medical device evaluation. Uh, they needed engineers to work with the doctors on how to um, mechanical things work in the body, looking at lasers, what's the safe and effective use of these products. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, then uh, I will just tell you how I got to NASA was I met a, a native Texan and he wanted to move to Houston. He asked me to marry him and to move back to Houston. And so that's how I ended up at NASA. And so when I got here, I began my career as a project engineer, working on small projects, um, asking lots of questions, learning as much as I could. Uh, when I showed up to the branch that I was in, I was the first female that was hired into that particular branch. I asked my division chief, I said, you know, hey, where are the other women? And he said, well, you're the first and we'll see how you work out. So always up to a challenge, I said, okay, well, we'll see how that goes. But I, I, I did experiments that flew on shuttle. I got to do experiment on astronauts. And before I knew it, I actually became employee of the month in that division. Uh, and then uh, from there, I went on uh, to go to the shuttle program where I moved up the ladder, became a uh, manager of shuttle missions. Um, I then moved to exploration, led organizations to actually do the early planning for our return to the moon and, and plans for going to Mars. And so then that's how I got to um, have the experience, the know-how to become the center director. And now, of course, you know, we're working right now today to fly our astronauts um, using SpaceX and Boeing's um, vehicles. A fellow panelist here with Northrop Grumman is a major player in, in the efforts in space exploration. Uh, we're building a vehicle that's going to be near the moon called Gateway. And um, Northrop Grumman is actually developing the habitation module that we'll use for that purpose. And then we'll go to the moon and then we will learn how to explore and then go on to Mars. So that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you very much. And we might very well come back to you for questions. But our next presenter will be Dr. Johnson, who is from the best public hospital in the country, 
Parkland, which is in District 30, Dallas. Dr. Johnson. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Johnson. I'm just so delighted and grateful to be invited to be among this dynamic group of panelists. Um, I'm Dr. Vivian Johnson, and I'm a pharmacist, not a medical doctor, but a trained pharmacist. Yes, today, if you go to college and major in pharmacy, when you graduate, take your board licensing exam, you will be a licensed pharmacist with a doctorate in pharmacy. Uh, you may ask, how did I decide to become a pharmacist? Well, I wasn't interested in pharmacy at first. Uh, I grew up in a very small town, Lake City, Florida, with a population of about 10,000. We had only one high school. I love music. I still love music. I grew up singing in the church choir and school choirs. I played the saxophone in the band from elementary until high school. But when it came to the time where I had to decide what I wanted to do, where, where I wanted to go to college, um, I, I knew that I wanted to do something to help people, to make people feel better. And when I started exploring, I considered medical school. When I looked at medical school, uh, I saw that it took nine to 12 years to be a physician. And I thought that was a little bit too long for me. So then I considered um, looking at chemical engineering and that particular profession did not allow me the opportunity to interact with people. I'm a people person. But what I did see is that my parents would often go into a pharmacy every month and we would see uh, men in white coats behind the counter. And my parents would always go and ask questions about their health and what which medications to, to take. And uh, I, I became intrigued with that. We also had a black pharmacist in my church. I asked questions about being a pharmacist. And I realized that that profession, pharmacy would allow me to continue to help people, and I had an interest in science. Um, and so I was torn between, I loved music, but I also loved science and math. But I, when I thought about it, I realized that I could still uh, actually major in pharmacy and continue to actually uh, sing in choirs, which I continue to do today. So I sought out to apply for pharmacy school. And because I have, I'm the youngest of six uh, children, all of my brothers and my sister who majored in chemistry, uh, all attended Florida a &M University, which is a historically black college. And we actually all went to that school. And I found that that was uh, H an HBCU that also had pharmacy as a, uh, a major. So I chose that school. Uh, as a pharmacy student, I was able to take all the courses that medical students actually take, uh, course courses, biology, uh, physics, chemistry, all of those courses, we were actually in the same class as medical students. So I could continue to got my degree and I started working as a hospital staff pharmacist at the Veterans Administration um, hospital here in Dallas after I completed a residency in New Orleans. After leaving uh, the VA, I moved to Parkland as a staff pharmacist, but I had additional training. And so what I want to say here is that when I came to Parkland, my ideal job was not available to me. But what I did, I saw the opportunity to make improvements. I saw what I could do to help patients here at Parkland, and I chose to accept the offer as a staff pharmacist 35 years ago. And fast forward, to I was able to actually move up and become the, the director over the pharmacy department. Uh, and today I serve as not only the leader over our pharmacy department, but the senior vice president of other science and uh, medical related areas such as radiology, which requires 
a lot of science and imaging laboratory services, uh, physical medicine and rehab, respiratory care. These are all clinical or STEM-like uh, professions that because of my leadership skill, I have been tapped to actually lead those other areas, even though I have a pharmacy degree. Uh, but I do want to say is that just look at opportunities and get involved in those opportunities. And what helped me is I sought out mentors as well to help me along the way. And today, again, I am a very responsible and a integral part of helping with the COVID-19 response team. I uh, overseeing the uh, vaccine that comes into the organization and is distributed to uh, all of the patients and the community. So it has really been rewarding to know that I have been able to make a difference, feel that I've made, been able to make a difference in this area, in the community, because I majored in a science field. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Hamilton will be next. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Congresswoman, for the opportunity to be part of this event. I'm very excited to be here with you. Um, I'm originally from Alexandria, Louisiana, and growing up, there was always the expectation that my brothers and I would attend college. My parents didn't give direction or guidance on the school we were going to or the field, just that we would be attending college. So I decided I was going to be a doctor a pediatrician, actually. I went to the library regularly to study. I researched childhood diseases. I maintained notebooks. I even interviewed my own pediatrician. I was serious. I was going to be a doctor. But then I realized there were certain procedures I wouldn't be able to stomach, bringing an abrupt end to my medical career. I was only in the sixth grade. I had to find a new job. In the ninth grade, a very special Algebra One teacher, who was also the boys' basketball coach, said I should be an engineer. More importantly, though, he said I could be an engineer. Those five words changed my life. I knew he didn't mean a trained engineer, but I also didn't know what an engineer did. I didn't know any female engineers. I didn't know any black engineers, men or women. But as the movie Historic Figures has shown us, they were out there. I just didn't know them. Computers and internet weren't as readily available then as they are today. So back to the library I went because I had now to research engineering careers and learn more about them. I finished high school and entered Southern University with my sights set on a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. As an undergraduate there, I worked for General Motors Saturn Division. So this is when they were beginning to introduce the Saturn car. We worked on the design and safety of the main electrical harness that, that was in the car. Um, also, as an undergrad, I earned a scholarship from Texas Instruments and held a summer internship position here in the Dallas area. I'm a product of TI's long commitment to student achievement. They invested in my education and they provided me with hands-on learning opportunities. Upon graduating from Southern, I attended University of Colorado, where I received my Master of Science degree in computer engineering, specializing in artificial intelligence, and my first job was with AT&T, developing and testing communication features for the White House and Congress. 32 years ago, as new administrations took over, they allowed you to change and add features to the communication system. So I was part of the team at AT&T Federal Systems that was able to do that, um, starting out. Since then, I have worked at DSC Communications, Alcatel, and now I'm at TI. Over the 32 years, I feel like my journey has prepared me. I could even say it's obligated me to be a mentor. I didn't know any black female doctors or engineers, but it never dawned on me that I couldn't be one of them. I always thought I could. Only one half of 1% of students major in math or science. 26% of STEM workers are female. 
I want our girls to know they can be math and science experts. They can pursue a STEM career, whatever it may be. Today, my professional home is in TI's education technology business. A lot of people refer to us as the calculator group. My career path didn't go exactly the way I had planned. Instead of helping kids as a pediatrician, I now have the opportunity to impact their learning and help them discover their passion and potential success in science, technology, engineering, and math. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Now we're going to have First Officer Shorty. Uh, First Officer Shorty, give your remarks. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I am in awe of the panel you've assembled, and I am trying to soak up every word. Um, I would just uh, introduce myself. My name is Charlene Short. I am a 737 pilot with American Airlines. I am based in the Washington, D.C. area. I live in Prince George's County. That's where I grew up. I live here with my husband and my three children. Uh, so the way my route toward becoming an airline pilot is I graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs uh, and then accepted a commission as an officer into the Air Force. Uh, after that, the Air Force taught me how to fly airplanes. And the first place I went uh, was Okinawa, Japan to do air refueling all over the Pacific in a KC-135. After that, I went to Kansas uh, and continued air refueling. Uh, that KC-135 was built in the 1950s. So I took a giant leap forward into the future on my way to California and learned the RQ-4 aircraft, which is a reconnaissance aircraft. And this aircraft does not require the pilot to be on the airplane. And in many cases, at least one of the pilot is not on the same continent as that airplane. So that was a very uh, interesting assignment. Uh, for me, STEM was always appealing because I just love to know how things work. I want to know the inner workings and kind of what goes on behind the scene. And so to, to me, STEM is that peek behind the curtain that it gives you the secret sauce. It's like, how is this made? How is it created? How does it work? How do you take hundreds of thousands of pounds of metal, put it in the sky and keep it there? You know, so that was the appeal for me for STEM. And so what I would offer to young people is uh, give it a chance. Uh, like Dr. Johnson said, I, I studied music uh, for a long time. Well, not a long time, but in high school. And uh, but I had a desire to serve. And so I tried the military. And then also, I never really knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so when I had the opportunity offered to me, I said, yes, I would, I would love to go to pilot training. I definitely want to learn how to fly. But it's not something I thought about before. So I would just offer our young, our young people, our young ladies, if there's something you're remotely interested in, ask. Let everybody know you're interested in, ask. And when that door opens or if you have to open the door yourself, walk through it. And thank you. Thank you very much uh, for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Ms. Purvis. You're next. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. And first, let me thank you for your enduring efforts to advance women and minorities in science and technology. So my name is Sean Purvis. I work for Northrop Grumman. I lead their enterprise services sector. Our organization sets forth our strategy and the delivery of all aspects of our corporate technology, our cybersecurity, our shared services, and digital transformation in support of our over 1,000 Northrop employees that support our United States government and our warfighter, both in the United States and globally. So I started in technology at the ripe age of seven. I wish I could say it was uh, my own doing, but the truth was that both of my parents spent their entire career at IBM starting in the 70s up here in Northern Virginia, where I, where I am born and raised and live today. Uh, my dad was an electrical engineer and my mother was a program manager. And back in those days, when you bought a personal PC from IBM, they would host a training class. And my mother hosted the Northern Virginia training class. Well, at those training classes, they had those big colossal donuts. And at age of seven, all I wanted was the donut on a Saturday, right? Hanging out with my mother. But when they had a free computer, they would allow me to sit down. And I would taught, I learned around the age of seven, how to do DOS command coding 
on an IBM personal computer. And that started the spark. I actually wanted to start my career as a teacher. I would uh, line up my baby dolls and I would host class each day. And that was going to be the goal that I had. But it was my parents who really encouraged me to go into computer science. My mother in particular, as she started to move through other parts of IBM, saw the lack of females and diversity represented in the ranks of technology, even in a company as technical as IBM was in those days. And so I pursued my computer science degree at Hampton University. And then I went on to get my master's of information systems degree at George Mason University here in Northern Virginia. I've spent my whole career as a government contractor, started first at Lockheed Martin and then SAIC, and now here at Northrop Grumman. And I wish also I could say that I loved computer science so much that I'm the best coder, but the reality was I was a horrible coder. And very quickly, as I started in the government contracting world, realized that that was not going to be my future uh, as, the, as the expert coder there. But I could understand how to talk to our customer. I could listen to their requirements and envision how that system would work. And so I very quickly moved into um, that kind of system integrator, that engineering designing role, where I would take the requirements that our customers would talk about and kind of translate that into the technical component that our coders would use. And the combination of the two built a really great team that went on for many years to deliver uh, technical solutions to our intelligence customer, our Department of Defense, uh, the United States government in support of our warfighter. Um, and both protecting both the homeland and protecting are the men and women who support the United States of America when they are overseas. I would just say that I love technology. Uh, we're leading digital transformation and digital acceleration for Northrop Grumman now. And we are fiercely curious about what's the world going to be five years from now or 10 years from now. And how can technology change the way we work, change the way we interact? and really move our, our, our environment and our people in a completely different light. And so we challenge all status quo. We come in and think about how can we make it better? How can we make it brighter? And how can we bring in diverse talent that really thinks differently and sees the realm of the possibility, it doesn't understand barriers to bring forth the best technology that we can for both the, our internal customers from North, our Northrop Grumman employees, but also on behalf of our external customers in space, aeronautics, our mission systems, and our advanced weapons and defense that crosses our four spec sectors across North of Grumman. I am ecstatic to be here today with you, Chairman Johnson, and this exquisite group of panelists, and I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you. Ms. Mollett, you're on. Well, hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You women are amazing. I'm just honored to even be on the same screen with you. So Erica Mollett, I am the CEO and founder of Kandake Tech. I also have a nonprofit called Beyond the Ball and a consulting firm that does work with school districts in the private sector called Expansion Solutions. So what you'll notice about my story that will be a tad bit different than uh, everyone else's story is that I am a non-tech CEO, which means don't ask me to fix a computer or code because I don't know how to do that. Uh, but it didn't stop me from starting a tech company. So I will start from the beginning like my friends here did and say that uh, I was raised by a dad who is a chemist. He's still a chemist to this day. And my mom uh, just retired from the Fort Worth Independent School District as a counselor. And because of my dad, I have always loved science. Didn't have a choice. If you wanted him to help you sharpen your pencil, you were going to learn about the chemical makeup of lead. If he was helping you change your oil, you had to learn everything that went into what that car's engineering. And so as I grew up uh, in middle school, I had braces and we had to go to the orthodontist. We had to go to our regular dentist. And I said, you know what? I need to grow up and be a dentist so I can have a building and put all of the different practices in one building so to make it easier for kids. And so that made me think that I wanted to be a dentist. So I went on to a high school for health professions in Fort Worth. And then I graduated my senior year and I went to Chicago to uh, spend a couple of weeks with my aunt and uncle. My uncle was a dentist. And the very first day I worked in his dental office, he pulled a tooth. And like Tracy, I almost lost my lunch. And I was like, man, 
There goes that dream. I don't want to be a dentist. I don't even want to pull a tooth. I don't think I'm, I'm cut out for this. And so I, what I realized was I wanted to have the business that invited all of those different practices to be in one building. So I changed my major very quickly uh, from pre-med to business. And I had a, got a degree in finance from Texas Southern University. And from there, I went on to work in the financial planning world. I actually got my investment licenses very early. I was still a junior in college at the time in Houston. And uh, from there, I came back to Dallas. I met a guy kind of like Vanessa. I met a boy and he invited me to come back to Dallas. And we got married and we're still married today, 15 years later. And I started my career in banking here. And so during that time, I enjoyed commercial banking, working with businesses with one to 20 million in annual revenues. And the recession hit, September 11th happened and banking just became very scary. And, um, and so I lost my job, found myself looking for a new opportunity. And someone said, well, why don't you apply for the city of Dallas? They've got a temp position in their finance department. So I took the temp position at the city of Dallas. And uh, before the temp position ended, I kind of like, I believe Dr. Johnson said, I got in and the job that wasn't the job I really, really wanted. I had no idea what I wanted to do for the city of Dallas. It was never on my radar. Uh, but I got a job as the director of ex offender reentry. Has nothing to do with my major. Invited to manage all of our Second Chance Act grant dollars, uh, and I did that for almost five years in our Housing and Community Services Department. And that was when I really started to see the gifts that I had um, that I that no one had ever challenged me to use, and those were to bring different people together to create one goal and then be able to speak with one voice as we impacted our community. So the way that ended up looking was me building an ex-offender reentry coalition for the city of Dallas with about 50 different organizations from the private sector, the nonprofit, the faith-based, the government and criminal justice sectors. And we got to go around the country and look at different evidence-based models that were working in New York and in DC and San Francisco and Los Angeles and built some really amazing programs to help our people here. And then I decided that I wanted to blend my business background and my government background. And so I applied to work for Sear Hill in our economic development department. Sear Hill is in the suburb of Dallas. And so I did that for another five years. I loved it. And then in 2017, I had the chance to start my own consulting firm. That's been going really well. We work with school districts, cities, real estate developers, et cetera, to create really cool programs. And to date, we've worked with Nike, PlayStation, Xbox, Converse, Jordan, you name it, to really help students to learn more about all the exciting STEM careers that they can have with the brands that they love and follow. So fast forward to 2019, and I've got a kid on my hands here. He's upstairs, Kyle, who loves basketball. And I wanted to make sure that Kyle didn't give up his love for science that he got from my dad or have an imbalance in his aspirations, just in case he's not a part of that 2% that goes on to the NBA or the NFL. And so I created a nonprofit to influence him as well as other kids that find themselves in the same situation and so I've partnered with the NBA and lots of other companies in sports medicine and stadium architecture to help them to see the math and science inside of the sports they love, as well as the many exciting careers they can have beyond the court of the field. So fast forward again to the beginning of 2020. And uh, we were having an amazing photo shoot. Unfortunately, our photo shoot happened at the exact same moment as Kobe Bryant's plane crash. And uh, the, the photo shoot was called 100 Brilliant Boys of Color. I had them all on the steps of the, the African American Museum in Dallas. So one of the kids pulls on my cocktail and says, Miss Erica. And I said, wait a minute, I've got a bullhorn in my hand. We can't talk right now. He said, no, Miss Erica, Kobe died. And he showed me his phone and I had to tell 100 boys and all of their parents what had just happened. And ABC News just happens to be there. And uh, so it kind of became some, somewhat of national news. And I started to have a lot of parents who called and said, 
I can really relate to what Beyond the Ball is doing. Uh, I have means, I have the ability to provide my kid with exposure, or some of them didn't. But what you can't buy with a teenage kid is you can't buy motivation. And what I realized was in, in addition to Beyond the Ball, there was a general marketplace of families that needed to have career exploration and academic options that really could excite their kids about their futures. So I started a tech company, Kandake Tech, to create education platforms. And our first platform that will actually is just now launching, Banneke.com, helps to connect the dots between a child's classroom, their passions, and their future careers. And we work with Hollywood, we work with uh, lots of sneaker companies, we work with tech companies all over the world uh, to really create kid-produced content, very innovative academic content, as well as to uh, create some really epic experiences for students. And so I'm really excited uh, about all the things that we're going to do. And I really appreciate meeting all of you ladies today. Well, thank you very much. I think we have enough time to go into uh, questions that have come in. But in the meantime, let me share with all of you that I started out in Waco, Texas, uh, and went to uh, St. Mary's at the University of Notre Dame and took nursing. And I'm old enough that when I expressed to my parents that I wanted to be a nurse, my father said, you must go to a school that is nationally accredited. I was really not that familiar with what he was talking about. But I learned fast that in many schools, you have to take a test each time you change states uh, if your school is not nationally accredited. So I looked around and Texas had no institution of higher learning that I could attend with a nationally accredited college of nursing. So that's how I ended up in South Bend, Indiana, what they call Notre Dame, Indiana. But I came back and I worked for the VA hospital, got involved with the YWCA. Well, I grew up in the YWCA, but that was my contact for getting involved in Dallas and got involved in civic work. I was pushed and encouraged by people of all sectors to seek public office. I had no clue, never thought about it, never dreamed about it, but I ended up running for the Texas House of Representatives back in 1972. Then I served with the Carter administration, uh, first as a uh, regional director of HEW, which was then Health Education Welfare. Then I came to the National Office of National Field Research under that administration. Uh, then after that, I was encouraged to go back into office. Uh, so I ran for the Texas Senate. And from the Texas Senate in 19, the class of 92, I came to the U.S. Congress. So that's a kind of a quick um, view of, of how I have spent my years. You are so phenomenal as, as accomplished women that I wanted to make sure that I shared you with our audience. And I'm so delighted that you are here. I'm inspired by each of you. Now, I have some questions here and I'll start uh, with uh, our NASA uh, Johnson Space Center. How did the recent recognition of Katherine Johnson and other hidden figures of NASA help build the momentum of Black women's participation in STEM? And going forward, how can we make sure that Black women are immediately recognized for their efforts? That's interesting, but Ms. Weiss, would you like to comment? Yes, I guess I would. You know, the, the movie um, Hidden Figures is actually based on actual events. You know, uh, a lot of people ask whether or not it was really based on a, a actual history. And I wanna make sure that everyone knows yes. And, but the sad thing is, is that that information was also hidden from us at NASA. Um, I was not aware until the movie came out uh, about the contributions of Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, uh, Dorothy Vaughn, and then many others. Um, when uh, we heard about the family that worked at IBM, 
they may have been familiar with the, um, you know, human computers, but at NASA, in our history, what we were being seen or what we saw on television mostly were the front room controllers. You saw the flight directors, but you did not see the women that were doing those computations that were critical, absolutely, uh, to being able to have a space program. And, you know, today we are honoring them, rightfully so. Um, the NASA headquarters building is named for Mary Jackson. She was the first African-American female engineer and a pioneer, not just in engineering, but she chose to change her career and move over to equal opportunity to open the doors for others. So when I think of their contributions and, and what they did, um, it is just, it's just inspiring, um, but we should honor our contributions and we need to do that because what we see, we then believe that we can do ourselves, right? And so, you know, having the buildings named after them, there's a street in Washington, D.C. called Hidden Figures Way. There's um, a facility in West Virginia named for Katherine Johnson. That was her home state. Um, but having those acknowledgments now gives others that um, did not know they can actually, they, they have a building, they have a place. They can say, you know, this is something someone achieved and now I can do the same. For um, myself, you know, at NASA today, we have um, a big focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making sure that we have a workplace where everybody feels that they can come and they can contribute. Um, I think that it's important, the different programs that we have that we're involved with. We have everything from starting with um, early education uh, programs to inspire students, and I think about uh, your brain trust uh, uh, there uh, and uh, Representative Johnson that you do in Dallas, where you expose those students to STEM careers. And you've been doing that for years. Yes. Um, but having the astronauts come and talk about how they got to be where they are and students can relate and they can say, oh, I can, yes, I can do this as well. Um, but then going on to our, our college programs where we have internships so that these students can come in and do hands-on jobs and get very excited and want to continue with their careers. And then what we're doing within the workforce of retention, uh, once we hire folks in, you know, how do we have them feel like they are a major part of the, the team and make them want to stay? Uh, we have what we call employee resource groups um, and we get together and, and help one another. Um, someone else on the panel talked about mentoring, and I'm a big, big, big proponent of mentoring. Uh, when I first started, as I said, I was the first um, African and female, African American female in my branch. But the white males, they were my mentors, and they did not, you know, you know, shy away. If I asked them any questions, they always gave me all of the information <laughs> as engineers, you know, they would want to give me more than I wanted, but it was great. And like a sponge, I just took it all in. And so I know for me, I think it's so important for us to continue all those efforts, you know, the early education, the college, and then uh, once we get folks in into the workforce, making sure that they can um, succeed. But in terms of uh, recognition, you know, I will say that uh, you know, programs like this, um, other um, efforts that we have uh, with Society of Black Engineers, Society of Women Engineers, um, those are ways for us to make sure that we're bringing our, our young people along and then helping them to be um, exposed to opportunities, but then also shepherding them and making sure that they have opportunities that maybe we did not have. But once we get those doors open, it's up to each of us to be able to, to keep and make it available to others. Well, thank you very much. And speaking of the hidden figures, uh, as you know, I, along with the Senator from uh, Delaware, uh, passed a bill to give them the gold medal and also have an extra medal for those women 
who were not recognized as those four women. Uh, because we know there are many hidden figures all over the place that you're like me, I did not know about it. Talking to the young uh, female author of the book, Hidden Figures, she said, no one asked me about it. I just lived in a neighborhood where these women were. And I saw what they did on a daily basis. And I felt that if I didn't document that, nobody would. And so we still honor them. Uh, only one lives now. And, uh, and we have not yet presented the gold medal this past two years ago, but because of the virus, it, it won't be struck until early very next year. So we'll be sure that you get an invitation to that as well. Now, uh, Charlene uh, Shorty, the uh, first officer of American Airlines, the percentage of women in the field of aviation has increased just minimally over the years. You've shared stories about getting stopped at the airport by people who said they had never seen a black female pilot. How important do you think it is that black girls have a role model in aviation to look up to? And who were your role models? Well, thank you for the, the question. Uh, it's extremely important for young black girls to have role models. Uh, two specific reasons come to mind. Initially, many cases, if you do not see a Black woman, it's not so much that you can't see yourself in that role. You mistakenly believe that that, does, that role does not exist at all. And so that's why it's important for young Black girls to see Black women in these positions in aviation. But also it's important for them to have role models so that they know they are not entering in alone so that they know that they're coming into a community. Uh, specifically uh, for the last 40, 40 plus years an organization has existed, the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals um, to just create community for, for people of color, for all people to understand uh, aviation. But more recently, a dynamic group of black women have formed the group called Sisters of the Skies where it started with less than 100 Black women pilots in all of the United States of America. Um, and now it's up to a whopping uh, 150 plus, uh, shooting for 200. Um, so for young people to know that they have a place to go, they have a place to land where they'll be welcomed and supported. Uh, for me personally, along my journey, there weren't very many role models specifically in aviation, but whenever I would attend a seminar or a briefing where a woman appeared on stage and my mind was blown. And I was like, oh, like I can do this. It's okay that I do these type of jobs or I have these types of aspirations, um, peers along the way. I have friends, a group of friends, while they may not specifically be women of color, but we were pilots together at the very beginning and we've been friends the whole time. So having community, having a peer group, uh, one last uh, person I will offer, a couple last people I will offer as role models that I saw kind of off in the distance uh, were Lieutenant General Retired Stacey D. Harris from the United States Air Force. Uh, she's just a dynamic human being and uh, an amazing uh, officer and leader, uh, woman, pilot, all of the things. And kind of the tied up uh, when you mentioned hidden figures as an Air Force pilot, I, you know, every now and then I would see a Black pilot, but uh, Teresa Claiborne was the first Black KC-135 pilot in the Air Force, and she came along as one of the first women pilots in all of the Air Force. And I only recently had the opportunity to meet her, and I'm super excited that I got to meet her. Um, so the last thing I will offer is uh, many times I felt like I couldn't reach out and touch these people. You know, they were similar to me, but kind of not, not too close to reach. Um, so I would encourage young people, especially with social media, reach out and touch them, send them a message. Hey, how did you get to do uh, what you do? Um, actually, I said that was the last thing. One last thing is the company that I currently work with. Um, we are having a lot of 
uh, very courageous conversations in our company about how to diversify and to bring uh, more talent into the, the pilot pool uh, from recruiting. Our recruiting team is excellent and very deliberate. Um, and then also the Cadet Academy. So this is another pitch for young people who want to fly from as early as high school graduate. You can apply to the American Airlines Cadet Academy and start working your way through through flight training and um, get there. We definitely we definitely need more uh, diversity, more diverse talent, more Black women because this is absolutely a career field for you. Now you're also an academy graduate from one of our famous U.S. academies. Give so us Air just Force. a very short comment on that experience. Oh, the Air Force Academy uh, was. Uh, a wonderful experience. I grew up here in Maryland, which is down the street from Annapolis, and I had no idea that there was an Air Force Academy. I will admit that here in public. Um, and I heard a classmate mention it, and it you, you don't have it's you don't have to pay, so it's free. Uh, it's a world class uh, education, the best laboratories and experiences and opportunities. You can be a doctor, a road scholar. Uh, travel the world on internships or exchange programs. Uh, the first time I really felt like I, I'm interested in flying was uh, a flyby by B-1 bomber. And I mean, the, the windows are shaking, horns are going off, afterburners are right in your face. And it's just, it's just the great place to be. Lots of opportunities, uh, lots of new experiences. Um, and again, it's in Colorado Springs. You reach out uh, and ask ask for help and apply, and you can do it. Well, thank you very much. Now, according to a recent study, Black women account for less than 3% of positions of doctors and only 2% of positions in the United States. Uh, how can we increase that number, Dr. Vivian Johnson? Because you have really climbed a lot of steps and you do it with a smile and with ease. Give our young girls some encouragement. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Johnson. You're absolutely right. It is, it is just surprising to know that we only have a small fraction of African-American women who are physicians or doctors. And so what I see, what you're doing today and what you've been doing for so long, exposing young people to these opportunities is something that we need to continue to do. Um, at a very early age, I heard uh, Ms. White talk about the elementary school. We actually have programs where we, we actually have physicians or doctors who go into schools so that students can see someone who looks like them. I do think that it is important for students to see that um, there's someone who looks like them and they can be that. Even with COVID-19, as we have seen, that it has really made it more, uh, exposed it even more, the disparities that exist. And we, we understand that a lot of people want to see people who look like them in those roles in order for them to actually receive the information that is out there about their health and what they need to do. And so we believe that it is very important that we continue to have programs like you have, what you're doing today, to expose students to the opportunities of being physicians, being pharmacists, being in the health field. Well, thank you very much. Let, let me share with you that um, when I went into public office in 1972, I got a chance to meet with every founder of Texas Instruments. And I realized that far beyond Texas Instruments, they all were very interested in community service. One became a phenomenal mayor of Dallas, Texas. But the thing that I learned very early is that they went from the calculator to Don, John Kelby developing the, what we call the chip, the semiconductor. And that made Texas Instruments a worldwide company. 
they were also one of my first sponsors of the very first uh, grain trust that I had when I came here in 1993. And so we have now a director of program and product management, Tracy Hamilton. The increase in the pipeline, Tracy, uh, in, with Black women in STEM is critical to our future in American innovation. What has Texas Instruments done to increase the participation of young Black girls in the effort to close the gender gap? Thank you for that question, Congresswoman. Um, so TI and TI Foundation are very committed to closing the gender gap and closing the gap in, to increase the number of black females um, in STEM careers. In Lancaster ISD, since 2012, we have invested significantly um, to transform them into what we call a STEM district. Uh, we know Lancaster students are 96% black, um, so we've been working very closely with them to increase those numbers. In 2020, we invested in Cedar Hill and DeSoto ISDs to also uh, develop STEM districts in those areas, and their demographics are very similar to those in Lancaster. In addition to that, we work very closely with Girl Scouts of Northeast Texas. Uh, we've been supporting them for more than a decade, and 12% of their members um, are black. At the TI Innovation Building, which is located at their STEM Center of Excellence, is an environment that allows girls to experiment, to explore, and I think even more importantly, they're led by girls um, teaching the sessions, providing the input, people who look like us as well. I think that's important because they see people, see females in STEM careers, teaching them STEM activities, and they know that, again, they can be one of those. They can major in one of those professions. Uh, we also support Design Connect Create, whose CEO is a former TIer, and Design Create, Connect Create uh, is a spinoff of High Tech High Heels. Uh, DCC touches young black females. Um, they have over 300 young ladies who have registered for their Accelerate Her, H-E-R, physics camp, as well as their Code Her coding camps, and a third of them were young black girls. But we don't stop at the younger levels. We also move into high school as well. We support the Young Wise program at UTD, and they have students who participate to do scientific research in team environments, as well as design experiences to help increase students' interest in STEM careers as well. Well, thank you. Uh, I know that the founders of Texas Instruments were also uh, the persons who gave rise to the organization and development of the University of Texas at Dallas and still give Lots of money, not just there though, because they do lots of money at Princeton and MIT and places around the country. Uh, they're all gone now, but they live on in the way they've contributed. Uh, now, uh, Sean, I know that I'm called upon to do so much recommendations and authorizations for funding uh, our research labs and universities and scientific agencies. But we also know that a major source of our science, our society's capacity for creativity and ingenuity, in fact, lies among underserved communities and communities of color. But actually, what are we doing to recruit and retain that diverse pipeline? of talent to fill these STEM related positions uh, to ensure that North of Dublin will have the talent that they need and that they can compete globally. Well, thank you for that question, Chairwoman Johnson. And so, you know, I think I would, we have two parts that I wanna talk a bit about from North of Dublin perspective. The first starts with going into that talent right at the beginning of the first seed that you can drop that they can and should be excited about STEM as a future career. 
when you think back to, to the story that I told of how I got started while it was donuts that got me into and at the computer at the, you know, at the early age, I was being poured into the fact that I could code. It was natural. It was, it was just kind of one of those things that I grew up with. And so one of the things that we try to do is to start exposing STEM to young talent and creating that passion to pursue that technology to career as early as possible in a young student's life. And in particular in diverse candidates and in particular in women in diversity to be able to see themselves as a, as a computer science major, as an engineer, as a technologist in the fields that we in particular hire from. And so we go in uh, long before they, they've got that, that other foundation set, we go in and have set a goal to increase our math and science proficiency for over 350,000 middle school students by 2030. We also established a teacher's academy where we train our middle school STEM teachers, and we've reached more than 335 teachers and 33,000 students, giving away over $22 million in combined contributions to education programs alone. You see individuals like myself, former computer science majors and, and leading current technology organizations going into those schools to demonstrate and show that we can not only have a career in technology, but that career in technology can lead you to some of the highest levels in corporations such as Northrop Grumman. But we also understand that when we get them here, we have to figure out how to keep them here, right? If we, when we get to folks here of diverse talent and women, uh, in these roles, we have to figure out what's that sticking glue that keeps them to Northrop. And so we have this kind of three-pronged approach. And one of that, the first starts about our culture. And we talk about it as the tone at the top. If you can imagine, I'm sure you can, in 2010, we had one woman on our senior executive leadership team. And today we have seven. Uh, our leaders are deeply in, involved in that talent conversation and measuring diversity and talent and our benches for succession across all different of our disciplines, not just in the core technology, but also in our senior leadership ranks. And we at North of Make try, try to make sure that at the tone at the top means that our leaders set the example and must be engaged and committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also have accountability. And so you can't just say it, you can't just talk about it. You know, what we find is that when you measure it, that's when it gets done. And so our leaders have goals and measurements that are set as part of our performance on how are we driving diversity, equity, and inclusion over the course of our, we have a five-year plan uh, that looks at all of our management levels, our director levels, our vice president levels, and we've now turned our attention to get down and into our technology levels at all parts of our organization. And so we, we measure, we hold our leadership accountable to making sure that we are achieving those goals. <laughs> based on that available prop, uh, 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 population. And then last, we look at how do we operationalize and sustain it. And much like my peers have spoken, we have employee resource groups like our African-American task group that is integrated as part of our DNA and the fabric. And they meet and they talk and they share and they learn from each other. And they really allow ourselves to create this network of network of networks that allow us to really mentor, have advocates, get exposure to job opportunities. One of the things I'm most proud of is we now share when an opportunity is coming and encourage each other on go out and interview. Um, but we also make sure that we've got a good candidate list for those positions, that they're ready for those positions, that they're able to have the right backing and the advocacy when they go into those opportunities and then continuing to mentor uh, those individuals when they're in those roles. And so it's, a, it's really, uh, Chairman Johnson, a, a complete 360 kind of program that looks at making sure our leaders are accountable, making sure that we set that tone, holding ourselves accountable to that piece, and then creating that culture that's inclusive and diverse and engaged and is passionate and is recognized by all parts of Northrop Grumman. Well, thank you very much. We have, we have chosen a question for each panelist to ask, but we also have a question that has come in for all which will be the last one. And after we finish hearing from Ms. Molet, uh, I will ask that question. Uh, and that question, you can be thinking about it. Ask if they have any advice for girls watching. That's the last question that we'll ask after uh, this one. Uh, now, uh, Ms. Molet, as CEO of Vatican, uh, you are uniquely positioned to lead your country's diversity efforts 
both internally and externally. Considering that our technology environment is always and rapidly evolving, how has technology inspired a new industry like gaming? And how are you building partnerships that ensure young people and underserving minority communities uh, can keep up? That's a very good question. So, you know, I would say that I'll start with the, the statement that you made about being uniquely positioned in tech to help lead diversity. I, I absolutely agree with that. And that a lot of that very much drives me every day. So my team at Banneke.com, our first education platform that we are launching uh, is multi-generational. I've got a lot of girls. I've got a lot of young men who are in middle school and high school. I've got college students. I've got, you know, retired teachers and scientists and techies. And so we are all able to, of, of every race and gender, and sometimes cognitive diversity is a big part of that for us. And so we are able to model what success can look like as a tech company when you have multiple multiple perspectives at the table. And you know, one would say, well, being an African-American woman, you've already checked off the box of diversity. I think big corporations and government entities, they say, well, as long as I've got Dr. Johnson or I've got Sean or I've got an Erica, I've, we've got diversity. But for me, I recognize that diversity, you know, I still haven't met the mark uh, I need more young people that are Asians. I need more kids with Down syndrome. I need more kids who come from rural America because diversity and perspectives from everyone is going to matter, especially for inspiring our kids. As it relates to building partnerships, you know, during the pandemic, uh, on a lot of the social uh, unrest that we saw, so many people from various corporations, all the way from your Fortune 500 companies like Nike uh, to your esports companies like FaZe Clan uh, and everyone in between, your Microsoft, Warner Brothers, et cetera, all of them wanted to be able to use their platform to help elevate youth in our communities. And for me, it was just a matter of sending a lot of DMs on LinkedIn saying, hey, I'm working on something. I'm just a mom in a suburb of Dallas who's got some ideas. I'd love to talk with you about how we can change the world together. And I've had CEOs and execs and innovators who've come to the table and really helped us to do that. And so the value proposition for them was that they recognize that they do have to build talent pipelines that represent everyone. And whereas one may say, okay, that's great, you know, assign that to your DEI team. The reality is, you know, my background's banking and I help them understand this is also a financial proposition. There are moms like me who have means, and I've got a 13 year old kid upstairs who I haven't mentioned yet, who builds gaming computers. And I'm still spending thousands of dollars out of my pocket to buy graphics cards and processors and, keyboard components and things like that. There's a whole group of kids out there and he's got tons of friends who are doing the exact same thing. So if you're only doing this because of the money, we are still an amazing target market. Girls are the same. And so being a CEO and often following the bold leadership of Representative Johnson, who's been my Congresswoman for as long as I can remember, I've always felt very uh, emboldened to have those conversations. You know, if I have a financial company that wants to work with Kandake and be a support to us, my first question is, what does diversity look like in your company? And as they're answering that question, I'm pulling up their meet the team page. And if I don't see enough of us, I'm asking, what's the problem? You know, that is important to me and you can't have my company's money. You can't have my attention. Uh, if you're not also doing this. And I've had different CEOs who've reached out to me from much larger companies to say, this is important to me as a CEO, but somehow it's not trickling down to my company. And to Sean's point, it has to do with accountability. At the end of the day, you can say it, you can put it on commercials, you can send computers to low-income communities, but if you're not truly creating accountability in people's paychecks, if their paychecks are not on the line for maintaining, retaining, and recruiting, 
uh, then, then it simply won't happen. And being on the outside of these organizations and no longer being a corporate employee or a government employee, I have a lot more flexibility to say the things that I want to say and advocate for that. <laughs> And wear my big curly hair everywhere I go or Jordans to an executive meeting. All those levels of freedom that uh, entrepreneurship has bought me. And I use that, uh, that opportunity to really fight for our people and for our kids. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been so very interesting. Uh, and uh, I, I can't help uh, but, but go back to space because... I have been so encouraged by the willingness of our uh, space centers and our astronauts to be available to come to high schools. As a matter of fact, we're looking for the schedule of another downlink uh, in Dallas so that the students can visit with the astronauts while they're in the space station. Uh, so uh, tell me, uh, Ms. Wise, what kind of advice do you have for girls? Uh, because we, we have had some women astronauts, but more importantly, we've had people that made sure that the astronauts were successful that included a wider range uh, of, of women. And yet the public didn't really know about this until a young lady who was a neighbor to four of these people that work to help to make the launch in the space successful were her neighbors. And she decided she had to tell the world how important they were to that venture. But there's so many other hidden figures. And that's the reason why I wanted to make sure that there was one gold medal set aside for those that are still hidden. But you are no longer hidden. And you certainly are out there achieved and in very special and a first. So what would you say to these girls that are watching this today? So uh, first I wanna just thank you again for uh, having me to be on this panel with such dynamic women and yourself. Um, but I would say Find your passion, you know, whatever your passion is. And for me, like I said, when I found engineering, it was like being in love, butterflies and, and happiness uh, all rolled into one. And so once you do, you know, pursue it and, you know, hold on to it. There will be times when things may get tough when you're in classes. I will assure you of that. But if you continue to have belief in yourself, then you can do it. When you're um, a younger uh, person and you're trying to figure out what you want to do, ask others, um, maybe ask to go to work with somebody for a day um, or potentially, you know, some of the things that are now available to students when they're in high school. They have technology high schools. They can then also um, join science clubs. But have an opportunity to actually try to try it out to see if they really like it. And then once they do and they find it, you know, when you go to college, um, you know, just hang in there, know that there are others that have gone through before you. And um, as was said about the, the number of people that are in doctors, still the numbers of um, female engineers is, is still not that high and especially in the minority community. So we need you um, and we want you to succeed. So if you are looking for a mentor, I, I heard somebody mention, you know, use the social media platforms, uh, go out and, and ask, find somebody. Uh, we, we are there for you. And I can assure you that like myself personally, I will, if I can't mentor you, I'm going to find somebody to mentor you. I will make sure that we have somebody that can introduce you. And I want to um, tell you, um, Representative Johnson, the, the young lady that won the spelling bee, the, the first African-American uh, to win the spelling bee. And I heard her interview and she said that, you know, she said four things she wanted to be. One was a WNBA player, but she did say she wanted to work at NASA. And you better believe that I said, let's find her. And I'm going to be uh, having a mentoring session with her. I am so excited about it. But, 
you know, even if she doesn't decide to come at NASA, she'll tell her friends and they'll tell their friends. And that's really how we how we reach um, the, the broader community. It's just reaching out one one young person at a time. Well, thank you so very much. Now, Dr. Johnson, you're in one of the most challenging positions in our nation right now. And I know that Parkland being a very first class public hospital, you face every possible diagnosis uh, that can possibly be done on a daily basis. And you have come to Parkland and moved right to the top. What would you say to these young ladies that are listening? Again, thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Johnson. I would say, look for someone who is actually uh, doing what you think you want to do. I would say, don't give up. I would say, if that opportunity that you want is not available right then, still be optimistic and know that you can go in and probably create those opportunities for you. And just find a mentor, find a mentor to help guide you as you go along. And just as Ms. White said, I'm available. And if I can't do it, I will definitely help, uh, help you find someone uh, to help you and guide you in, your, in where you want to go. And I want to say, it's not just for the, the young people who are in uh, high school. There may be adults who are in careers right now and wanting to make a change. If they see something that they would like to do and change, I would say also find someone who's doing that, observe them, and see if that's something that you want to do and you can change your careers at this time as well. Thank you so much. Our time is running out. But let me say this. I, I, I live in Dallas. I work in Washington where I am now. And I have to fly back and forth. As a matter of fact, I just got off of one of those planes, American Airlines, late last night. You have a great responsibility of getting on that plane and making sure you get where you're headed and make sure that the people feel safe. How do you see that as a challenge? And what would you say to young people, young girls especially? I would let the young girls know that they are 100% up for the challenge. Uh, there is a, a culture of safety in all of our training. Um, and the way that you learn to drive a car, you can get on an airplane and learn to fly an airplane. Uh, you will be safe. You will be giving a service to people, uh, reuniting loved ones or getting people to their business trip or medical facility. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, one bit of advice I will offer to young women, uh, identify who you are within yourself. Identify your uniqueness and your strengths and hold on to that no matter what so that you may show up wherever you go authentic, authentically. Just be confident. Do not seek validation from anyone else. Know who you are and hold on to that no matter what and you will, you will go far and you will achieve whatever you want to do. Well, thank you very much. Our time is just about out, but let me thank all of you for being phenomenal participants today. Uh, we have heard some very truly incredible stories uh, from some truly incredible women. And I know that any young girl watching this has got to be inspired. Uh, it's important to be, uh, having a discussion like this to continue to have discussions like this with our young people and make sure that we let them understand that your paths are possible, uh, that it takes effort, focus, and, and some ingenuity, but it's possible because you are real success role models. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, Toyota, Amgen, Genetech, and Bayer for this brain, making this brain trust possible. And finally, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for watching and carrying the word on. We can do it. And that's why I wanted phenomenal women to say 
to young black girls and all others. Yes, we can. Thank you so very much for participating.